In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the differences from the Spring Framework to Spring Boot. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, and I think that kind of trips new students up, is what is, you know, I might have heard of the Spring Framework, but what is that and how does it compare to Spring Boot? What are the differences there? Like, I don't understand that. So it, we're going to try and break down those kind of two separate projects and talk about why they exist and why they're needed and hopefully that'll clear a lot of the things up and going forward we're just going to refer to this as basically building spring applications because that's what we do and as you'll see we use spring boot to do that going forward so let's jump on in and take a look at the differences first what is the spring framework so it has the name framework in it. It is a Java framework, and it's really this large framework that handles all the kind of infrastructure that an application may need so that you can focus on the business logic. Now, I have platform in there because I don't like to really refer to it as just a framework. It's become so massive, and it supports enterprise-level applications that it's not just a simple framework. It's really a platform for building Spring applications. More importantly, a platform for building these different types of applications using uh, the Java uh, language. So there are plenty of other frameworks in the Java community, things like J2EE, uh, Play, JSF, GWT, Vaden, Grails, Struts, we can keep going. Um, but as we'll see in a couple slides here, none of them are more widely used than Spring, so that becomes pretty important. First off, it's free and open source. It was created back in 2003 by a gentleman of the name Rod Johnson, and he really created this in response to the complexity of, create, of the early J2EE specifications and creating these larger apps. He just found that it was really complex and he said there's got to be a better way to do this and there was and that's kind of where Spring was born. So Spring supports a wide range of application scenarios. In large enterprises uh, these applications off have often existed that need um, an application server to run on such as say Tomcat. So we can still build these traditional applications, deploy an application or deploy a war, a web archive to one of these application servers and it'll run. We can also create these single jar applications which have an embedded server in them. And this really gives us the ability to run them in different environments like a cloud environment. Uh, and we can also have these standalone applications that may be something like a batch or an integration workload that don't really require a server. So it does support a wide range of applications that we can build out. So what is Spring Framework made of? Well, it's made up of these different modules. And so Spring at its core is a dependency injection container that gives us multiple ways to define what are called beans. And these beans are really kind of instances of classes that the container manages for us. And so at the core level, there's this IOC container. There's things for handling things like events and resources, um, internationalization, validation, data binding, type conversion, AOP, etc. Then we have a layer for testing, being able to uh, have support for testing our applications, uh, mocking objects, uh, being able to test the web side of our application. So really the foundation for testing. Then there's a data access layer which gives us transaction support, DAO, DAO support, JDBC, ORM, marshalling, etc. Then we have the web servlet layer which is the Spring MVC application. So we have support for building out our web applications. It also gives us things like WebSocket and SockJS and Stomp Messaging. New to Spring Framework 5 is the Web Reactive layer, which is Spring WebFlux. And this is really a whole new way of thinking of building applications. 
Um, but this gives us the same way to build applications, but in a non-blocking fashion. So there's a whole layer for that. Then we have integration, things like remoting, JMS, JMX, email, task, scheduling, caching. And finally, support for different languages. So I mentioned this before, but we can write our applications in Java, or we can have support for things like Kotlin or Groovy. So that is what it's really broken down into. And I broke these down into these different sections because if you go to the Spring Framework reference documentation, this is how it's broken down. And that documentation is really good. So you can kind of jump into these different sections and get information based on what you're looking for there. So that's kind of the Spring Framework broken down. Now I want to take a look at this. This was a survey done by the folks at Rebel Labs. And we really wanted to answer the question, is Spring popular in the Java community? And out of everybody they polled, almost 46% of respondents say that they built their application code on the Spring framework. That's right, almost one in every two developers base their code on Spring. And to me, that's pretty astounding. That, I mean, obviously, it's popular, it's not going anywhere, and you know, it's something that you should be learning. Uh, if you're going to want a job in this industry, uh, writing job applications, most companies are using it. So it's something that you should know. All right, so that's a little bit about what Spring Framework is. So what is the Spring Boot? Why do I need Spring Boot to write these applications? Why not just use Spring Framework? So Spring Boot takes an opinionated view of what building these Spring applications gets you and gets you up and running really quickly. And this is important because the more power that Spring Framework kind of gotten over has gotten over the years, it's it got to a point where it got pretty complex to just spin up a new application. Configuration was a nightmare. I mean, it's gotten better now that we've lost all these XML files, but if anybody's created applica Spring applications in the past, you know, configuring them and creating all these different XML configuration files was a big pain. So really what we're doing is we're providing, the Spring Boot is providing us with some sensible defaults to really get our Spring application up and running really quickly. And if we need to change things, it's not gonna stand in our way. And the way that it do, does this is through a few things. One it are these things called Spring Boot starters. And these starters are dependencies that are made up of other dependencies. So what you say is when you're kind of creating a new application is you say, I want to build a web application. Well, now Spring Boot's going to assume that, all right, if you're building a web application, you probably want uh, an embedded server like Tomcat, but you can change that out later. You probably want some Jackson for being able to kind of marshal your objects. You probably want validation. You probably want Spring Web. You probably want Spring MVC. So just including this one dependency will basically include a whole bunch of other dependencies that will allow you to create that application. And not having to manage all of these dependencies and more specifically the versions that play nice with each other is a big boost to getting started on a new project. All right, so now we're gonna talk about Spring Boot auto configuration. And this is really where some of the power of Spring Boot comes in. So when your application starts up, there's a, a, a main annotation on your application called at Spring Boot application. And this is really just comprised of other annotations. One of them is at enable auto configuration. And what this does is it looks at a bunch of enable or auto configuration classes. And these auto configuration classes basically have conditions on them. And some of these conditions can be property based, uh, whether a existing class exists, if something's on the class path, go do this. So I'll use an example. Uh, in this course, we're gonna create um, an in-memory H2 database and there'd be a nice way, to, it'd be nice to be able to see what kind of data is in our in-memory database, right? Well, fortunately for us, H2 has something called an H2 console. 
and this lets us look at the data in our in-memory database. Now, you wouldn't want to have to go and configure this console yourself. So what Spring Boot auto configuration does here is there's an H2 console auto configuration class. And one of the properties it looks at is if you have a property um, that is enabling the H2 console. So whatever it is, spring.h2console.enabled, I think it is. And if that is set to true, it's going to create a new bean for you and make it available. And this allows you to set a property, start up your application, and boom, you can jump into the H2 console and start viewing your data. So this is just one tiny example. You can imagine like all the different things in your application that you might have to configure. Things like data sources and um, JSON marshallers and validators and things like that. As you start to get into more complex applications, this becomes a real pain. And even in just our H2 memory database example, that could be a real pain. So these auto configuration classes are really part of the power of Spring Boot. Again, helping us with sensible defaults so that we can focus on writing business logic and not worrying about the infrastructure of our application here. It's also very developer friendly. So we have something called DevTools, which we'll look at in this course. And DevTools really helps us when we're building out our applications. So We'll, again, we'll, we'll get into the de details of it, but one of the things that it does is kind of provide us with some hot reloading. So if we save a controller class or change a request path, we don't need to fire off an entire server container restart. And if you've ever gotten stuck in that cycle, that could really kind of delay some productivity or, or kind of cut into your productivity there. So. There's things like that, um, again, ability for like, things like logging and debugging. Uh, we have support for that. So it's really developer friendly and production ready. We're going to look at the actuator in this course. And the actuator is awesome. It gives us some really good insight into what our application is doing. So what I want to kind of get into your head here is that you're never going to create a spring framework application without boot again. I mean, you may land a job where you have to provide support for, for maybe some type of legacy Spring Framework application, um, but any new project that you're going to create a Spring Framework application, you're using Spring Boot to do so. And so that's really what um, I want to make sure that you understand. So that's what Spring Boot is, why it's so important. You're going to see it more throughout this course uh, be, just because when we get into creating these new projects and just kind of all the simplicity that Boot gives us, you'll you really start to understand it more. But I just wanted to kind of break down what Spring Framework was, what Spring Boot is, and why we actually need it and why we want it. But again, you'll see that more throughout this course. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and move on.